Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Jean Andre, and I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Environment at the University of Waterloo. Welcome to this important conversation about hope and climate change. You know, although we're gathered together virtually, I still want to begin by acknowledging that much of the work of the University of Waterloo takes place on the traditional territories of the Neutral, Anishinaabe, and Haudenosaunee peoples. Our main campus is situated on the Haldeman Tract, land granted to the Six Nations that includes six miles on either side of our amazing river, the Grand River. Our active work toward reconciliation takes place through research, teaching, community building, and in working with and through our Office of Indigenous Relations. Well, again, welcome to this talk, a talk that is made possible and is co-hosted today by University of Waterloo's Organizational and Human Development, the Sustainability Office, and the Interdisciplinary Center on Climate Change. You know, climate change is an incredibly important topic, and it's been so for a while. In fact, you know, I've been part of this conversation for more than three decades, but the conversation is unfolding. It's no longer about the threats for future generations, but it's something that's happening here and happening now. And of course, it's happening everywhere. Food and water security are increasing concerns as are supply chain disruptions and climate-induced migrations of peoples and other species. And these are often cutting across and exacerbating racial, gender, economic, and social inequalities at the same time. Clearly, there's an enormous amount of work to do. At the University of Waterloo, we have a long history of engagement with climate change. We were one of the first and currently the largest faculty of environment in Canada. And we were formed in that first environmental movement in the 1960s. And we haven't lost our passion for dealing with complex issues and working towards solutions. We have a number of programs and centers focused specifically on climate. And I think here of our Master of Climate Change, our brand new BSc on climate environmental change, but also um, our interdisciplinary center on climate change, which brings together researchers um, from across the whole campus. We also have a lot of other integrative initiatives that deal with sustainability more broadly and, of course, therefore connect with climate change. And I'm thinking as an example, we have a new degree that brings together accounting with our School of Environment, Enterprise and Development. We're also making significant commitments through our own operations and practices. These relate to carbon neutrality in our emissions, but also to reducing the carbon intensity of our investments. But none of this has been easy. And the steps that we have yet to take will not be easy. But together, we can do this. And that's why the conversation today about hope is so important. So this time, I'd like to introduce our two speakers, our two panelists, Dr. Sarah Birch and Dr. Catherine Hayhoe. They're going to have an open conversation on how we can remain hopeful and how we can curtail climate change and its impacts. So I'll begin first by telling you about, a bit about Sarah. Sarah Birch is an associate professor in geography and environmental management at the University of Waterloo. She's also the executive director of the university's Climate Change Institute. She holds a Canada Research Chair in Sustainability Governance and Innovation. She's an expert in transformative responses to climate change, especially at the community scale and through contributions that small businesses can make. She's a lead author on IPCC's sixth assessment report. And she leads discussion today and facilitates some of the questions coming from you. So she'll be explaining to you how you can submit these questions. I'm also thrilled to welcome Catherine Hayhoe to our campus conversation. Catherine is the chief scientist for Nature Conservancy and a Horn Distinguished Professor and Endowed Professor of Public Policy and Public Law in the Poli Sci Department at Texas Tech University. Her book, Saving Us, a Climate Scientist's Case for Hope and Healing in a Divided World was released just last fall and I expect she'll tell us a little bit about it. Catherine hosts the PBS digital series, Global Weirding, and she's named one of Time's 100 Most Influential People, the United Nations Champion of the Earth and the World Evangelical Alliance's Climate Ambassador. Thank you both 
to Sarah and to Catherine for joining us in this important discussion. I look forward to being hopeful with you. Over to you, Sarah. Thanks so much, Jean, uh, and welcome everybody. I'm really thrilled to be here and I, I, I'm really looking forward to my conversation with Catherine and all of your questions over the next hour or so. Um, before I get started, just a couple of uh, obligatory housekeeping um, points. So uh, first off, you can turn on live captioning at the bottom of your Zoom window there. There's a nice diagram showing you how to do that. Um, in terms of structure for our time together, Catherine and I are going to start off just by a, a short conversation, kind of framing the topic and exploring the issue of, of hope uh, and climate change uh, for ourselves. And then we're going to move into an open conversation in response to your questions. So we're going to be taking questions throughout the event, as I think you know. Um, you can add those in the chat. Um, as the conversation unfolds, you can also do that uh, using Poll Everywhere. So the link is, and the directions to use Poll Everywhere is, is in the chat there. Um, so please do go ahead and feed your questions into that Poll Everywhere uh, link so that Catherine and I can take them up and discuss them. So I think that's all for our, for our housekeeping. Uh, so let's get started. Uh, Catherine, I'll ask you to turn on your camera and uh, you and I can start our discussion. Welcome, thank you for being here. Uh, I still look forward to, to any chance for you and I to, to spend some time together and talk. So, and we have lots of questions already coming in from the folks attending, so no shortage of things to talk about. Um, so let's just get started perhaps by taking a moment to um, set the stage and reflect a little bit on the interesting times that we find ourselves in. Um, I was, it, was, it was occurring to me as we were getting ready this morning that I, I spent the weekend in Manitoba in Winnipeg, which is where I'm from. And, and it's, it was a rough weekend in Winnipeg for those of you who are watching the news. It's that sort of perfect storm of, of uh, frozen soil and ice and snow, and then an absolute downpour for days on end, uh, leading to some pretty significant flooding throughout the city, which has happened uh, before. Uh, in that area. And uh, I had that in mind because also over the last couple of weeks, as, as Jean mentioned, we've just seen the launch of the latest intergovernmental panel on climate change report, which tackles um, climate solutions, how to reduce greenhouse gas emissions um, and address the causes of climate change. So it's been a busy time, a lot of, a lot of climate in the news. And I just wanted to ask you to sort of take a step back and reflect on this moment that we find ourselves in and what is sort of really blipping on your radar? What are those things that you're looking out for and watching in the climate space? Well, these days, it's almost impossible to, you know, pick up a newspaper, or go to your favorite news site and not see something that directly relates to climate change impacts just hitting you in the face. So as you know, I'm originally from Toronto, Etobicoke specifically, um, but I live down here in West Texas, which is right next door to New Mexico. And we have had red flag days. That's days when you have super high wind and it's incredibly dry. Like I'm talking one or 2% humidity for weeks on end. And there are huge wildfires in New Mexico right now that are just combining with each other and then burning more area and then combining and burning more area. And I don't even know how many people are currently evacuated. Now, of course, climate change doesn't cause a wildfire. Most of them are accidental human ignition south of the border and lightning ignition north of the border, just because most of us live within what, 200 kilometers of the border. Um, but we see these massive hot and dry conditions, unusually dry, unusually hot, making these wildfires burn greater area because the vegetation is all dried out. With heavy rainfall events, we know that there's more water vapor in the atmosphere because it's warmer. So when a storm comes along, as it always does in spring in Winnipeg, there's more water vapor for it to sweep up and dump on us than there was 50 or 100 years ago. So today, the vast majority of us are worried. And why should we not be worried? <laughs> we should. It's a completely rational response to what we're seeing. I mean, climate is changing faster than any time in the history of human civilization on this planet. This is an unprecedented and very dangerous experiment that we're conducting with the only home that we have, that our families have, that our children have. So it's no surprise that we see the exponential rise in anxiety 
and urgency. And I see this all the time, and you probably do too, especially on social media. It's gotten so bad that people are actually turning on each other and turning on climate scientists and blaming each other and blaming climate scientists for the fact that we haven't fixed this problem. What that reflects though is the fact that we're worried, but we don't know what to do. And when we're worried and we don't know what to do, we lash out or we retreat. And neither of those are conducive to constructive action. So that's why today more than ever, what I wrote about in my book, this concept of efficacy, the idea of if I do something, can I make a difference? That concept is even more important today, I believe, than it was a year ago because we have skyrocketing levels of concern and stunning lack of efficacy. Nobody believes that we can make a difference. But in reality, as I talked about in my talk, we, we people, we ordinary people are the only ones who have ever changed our modern industrialized society in the past and we're the ones who must change it again. And to quote Christiana Figueres, who um, is a Costa Rican diplomat who shepherded the Paris Agreement to its conclusion. She's just a phenomenal inspiration to all of us in this area. After she finished the Paris Agreement, rather than retreating to a beach in Costa Rica on a hammock for the rest of her life, she sat down and she penned the most defiantly hopeful book I have ever read called The Future We Choose. And she said, here's what the future looks like if we decide we're doomed and we don't do anything. Here's what the future looks like if we fight as hard as we can for, as the IPCC says, every bit of warming that matters, every action that matters, every year matters. If we fight for that, here's what the world would look like. And she concludes this juxtaposition of those two worlds, which are clearly up to us. We're the ones our choices determine them. She says this, she says, the biggest lesson that we learned, imagining that we picked the better world, looking back, is that we were only ever as doomed as we believed ourselves to be. Absolutely. You know, it's interesting um, that you mentioned that because I, I often get this the question, and I'm sure you do too, um, you know, how, how can you maintain um, inspiration or why are you hopeful or what's the source of your the source of your motivation or the source of your hope and and sometimes I, I answer it differently but often what comes to mind is what is the alternative <laughs> like this is often what comes you know the only alternative to me is is um giving up or abandoning abandoning hope and that seals the deal so you know to me it's um I love that. It, it is the the logical next step to um, assume that there are actions to be taken, which there are, there are actions that work, which there are, and there's a growing, you know, consensus that those are necessary, which there is. So that's, you know, to me, it's the only, <laughs> it's the only reasonable option, even in light of pretty extreme evidence that this is unfolding in, in severe ways. I love that. What is the alternative? I, I, I think that um, some people, though, and you, I'm sure you've seen this as much as I have, and, and you, you might be listening, you might be feeling exactly this way. Um, some, some have a very visceral, visceral reaction to the word hope. Yeah. And I often hear it referred to as hopium. The <laughs> idea that it's just a placebo yeah. to keep people sort of calm down until disaster happens and it's all over. Right. But I, I would argue, and I'd love to hear your opinion on this too, I would argue that that's not a real, that's not a definition of real hope. That's a false hope. Because you don't need hope when everything's going well. You need hope most when it's not going well. Mm -hmm. And hope is that small chance, not a guaranteed chance, but a small chance that if you fight as hard as you can, doing everything you can, we can make a difference. And so that type of hope begins by saying it's really bad and it's going to get worse. And the future is not guaranteed, but it's up to us. But if I do something, it will make a difference, that tiny little bit of difference. But if we do something together, it will make an even bigger difference. And that is the sense of efficacy. So efficacy and hope, I feel like are completely interlinked. Whereas false hope, there's no sense of efficacy because false hope is, oh, somebody else will take care of it. Somebody else will fix it. It's not so bad. There's no efficacy in false hope. What do you right. think about that? Well, you know, you bring to mind, and I think you and I may have talked about this before in our, in our, last opportunity to have a chat such as this. Um, but one of my favorite uh, kind of mm -hmm. understandings or definitions of hope comes from Rebecca Solnit. And mm -hmm. some of you may have read, read her work, but she talks about the difference between hope and optimism. And I mean, these are words we can define for ourselves in any way we want, but 
you know, she talks about optimism as this kind of blind belief in the goodness of things and, you know, um, that naive kind of Pollyanna feeling um, rather than hope, which she defines as, as an account of complexities and uncertainties with openings. So hope for her acknowledges the complexity of the problem. It grapples with the truth of things. Um, it tries to appreciate just how complex things are. It's not a reductionist simplifying thing. It's a really complex feeling, but then giving real, giving those cracks, those openings their due as well and moving through those. And I appreciate that. I think you can be both hopeful and, and try and as much as our puny brains can wrap them around the full complexity of the issue and just, just how urgent it is as well. Yeah, that's a really good perspective. And yes, I do know that essay you're talking about, and I think it's fantastic. <laughs> um, there, there's so much good writing on that. In fact, I've even collected a series of very thoughtful issues that dig into that question of realistic hope versus false optimism. Um, and I use those for my for one of my classes at the end of the class. And I asked my students to read these and reflect on them coming from different people, like one's by a medical professional, one's by, you know, one's by a writer, one by a climate scientist, and just sort of reflecting on, it's really an existential aspect of being human, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it absolutely is. And I wonder, you know, with, I, I love the way you frame um, the idea of efficacy in your book. And I wonder if we could take a second, actually, just to discuss um, something that I'm noticing in the climate conversation and, and how fiery it is at the moment um, around individual actions and then collective big, heavy decisions, policy-making decisions, mm -hmm. decisions in the private sector and industry. And I, I sense that the, the tension here, or at least one aspect of the tension is that folks are being told at the same time that you need to take all of these individual actions um, to change and to change your own behavior, which in some ways can be very empowering because it's actual things you can do in your own world and space, but then simultaneously told that none of that matters because of <laughs> a large industry or big decisions about, you know, the way our cities are built or, or whatever that are out of your hands. And um, I think that connection between individual choices and individual action and then um, all of those bigger decisions that we do participate in through voting and various other um, mechanisms, but that do seem sort of so big to wrap our heads around and, and out of our control. How do you think about the links between individual choices, individual action, and those bigger, bigger shifts? That's really the the big question that we hear all the time. And, you know, people on social media, for example, love to debate things. And so there's this endless debate of whether it's individual actions or system-wide change. And my answer to that is yes. Yeah. Because how does the system change other than through individuals changing it? The system is not a set of cogs and gears and wheels. The system is living, breathing people who we live somewhere we love things, we love people, <laughs> we, we have all these points of connection to others in our community. And, but on the other hand, we talked earlier about how, you know, when, when we're really anxious, one of our, our human mechanisms, our defense mechanisms is to try to control things. And so if we can control our own lives, we feel, okay, it might be okay. I'm controlling my own life. I'm, you know, zero waste, for example, and zero waste is a great thing to do. I, you know, I, I would be so lucky if I could ever get there myself one day. You know, I've, I've changed all my light bulbs. I have solar panels on the roof. I don't eat meat. I don't even have a car anymore. So, and I'm not saying things, you know, I necessarily done, but I've definitely made steps, all, all steps in my personal life to move towards those goals. But then I run the numbers. And it turns out that if all of us who cared, and most of us do care, did everything we could to cut our personal carbon footprint, that wouldn't even take care of a quarter of the problem. Yeah. And then we've done everything we can, you know, to cut our air travel. And then we hear that an airline's running 3,000 empty flights to keep their gate assignments. And we think, why even bother? Or we're so obsessive about changing our lights and turning our lights on, and then we see like all these, you know, full tower of office buildings that just keeps the lights on all night. Or we, we recycle everything we can and we go as low waste as we can, and then, one poor woman was sharing this with me. She ended up in the hospital for a serious health concern, and thankfully she's better now. But she said, in one day, they created more plastic waste and overall waste than I've created in a single year. I asked myself, what was the point? And so then, 
if we have built our sense of the world would be okay if I do everything I can personally in my life, then we run into a situation where it shows just how little our personal choices matter. Our efficacy plummets. Right. We think, why am I doing this? Why am I spending so much time doing this if I, my individual choices can't make a difference? But what we're doing is we're not realizing how we make a difference. How we make a difference is through our actions. Of course it is. But it's through how our actions influence all of those around us. And one concept I think is really helpful is that of instead of focusing on your carbon footprint, to think about your climate shadow. That's how we influence people around us. And there's even this really great quote um, from Mother Teresa about the power of individual actions. And I don't have it totally memorized, so I'm just going to Google it quickly. <laughs> Change the world and try to share it with you because I think it, it so perfectly summarizes um, what she did. And she said, um, oh, I, I alone cannot change the world, which is, you know, exactly true, one single person. But, and here's what she said, I can cast a stone across the waters to create many ripples. Right. And if all of us cast that stone, that is how the world changes. And how do we cast that stone? By engaging with those around us through using our voice. Now, sometimes our voice is simply doing something where other people can see us do it. That's communicating, using our voice. Often, it's literally using our voice to say, hey, I tried one of those Beyond Meat sandwiches. <laughs> they were great. Or have you considered doing this? I tried it and it was really phenomenal. Or what happens to the food that nobody eats in our cafeteria? Where does that go? Because food waste is a big problem and there's people going hungry in our own community today. Or what's the source of the electricity that we use? Or have we done an energy audit for our company or our business? Or have yeah. we winterized our home? Or I winterized my home and then I saved so much money. Yeah. So using our voices to advocate for change, and part of that includes voting. Part of that includes calling for more coverage about climate change in the media. Every story about the, how our disasters are increasing should mention climate change. Part of it includes voting with our money, the banks we use, our finances. Part of it includes using our voices to call for change with the organizations we use in the communities that we're part of. Every single one of us, unless we are literally a hermit living in the woods in the Yukon who's not on social media, because you can live in the Yukon in the woods and be on social media and have a tremendous positive influence in the world, right? A viral following, apparently. <laughs> yes, I have a huge yeah. following. I yeah. am thinking, of course, of the guy who does those wonderful dances I in the know. snow. You're so good. <laughs> I know. So even living in the woods in the Yukon off the grid, you can still have a tremendous influence on the world. And so unless you are literally detached from society, you have a way to influence people for good. Everybody has a voice from the youngest child to the oldest citizen. And kids are so inspiring, showing us how they're using their voices for good. How can we not do the same? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that strikes a chord. I was just in my second graders class. My daughter is in second grade and I visited her class yesterday to talk to them about climate change. And wow, did they have questions and, and thoughts and feelings about the whole thing, which is great. And I, I guess part of... Um, Part of what you said, I just wanted to highlight, you know, one of the really interesting findings from this latest uh, intergovernmental panel on climate change report is that individual choices are responsible for an enormous portion of emissions, but our hands are tied because we're locked into high carbon systems in a lot of ways, right? So exactly. there have to be collective decisions that unleash that potential. And those collective decisions are things like what is the efficiency to which all vehicles are built or you know what vehicles are available for sale like how is your city designed so that you know is it a short distance for you to get from your home to your work and and a distance that you can safely ride your bike or walk or is it a vast distance and you have to get in the car because there's no other choice so you know that there's this really tight connection between those decisions that are made um, mm -hmm. around us and then our ability to choose something different so i do think that you know, um, by taking those individual actions that you described and talking to people, we are communicating to those who make decisions on our behalf that it's a priority for us and ultimately kind of giving them our permission to lead on the issue, right? Like this is something that matters to us. So go ahead and step out and, and set, you know, higher standards for vehicle efficiency or go ahead and intensify and densify our cities. You know, we, you have our permission. So that's, a crucial link, I think. I, I completely agree with you. I mean, here's what we want. We want the easiest, fastest, and cheapest option for people living in big cities to be public transportation. Yeah. 
So that's the default. And you have to pay more and put more effort into it if you want to drive a car. We want the cheapest cars to be EVs. If you yeah. want an internal combustion engine, it's going to be harder to find and it's going to cost more to buy and to run. You know, we want it to be the default for everybody so that they don't have to think about making conscious choices and they don't have to pay more for it. Because yeah. if the solution is to make the consumer pay more, climate impacts already disproportionately affect the people who are lowest income. They're already disproportionately affected by that. And so if climate solutions depend on everybody paying more individually, well, the richest co corporations in the world who produce the fossil, fossil fuels that we use, you know, they're responsible for something like, you know, 70% of the problem and all the profits. Well, they sort of, you know, get away scot-free. Well, no wonder British Petroleum was one of the corporations that popularized the idea of the personal carbon footprint. Because if it's you terrible person's job, you know, you're the ones who are doing this. We're just providing it. We're not making you use it, yeah. you know? And, and so that's sort of the way that our society has absorbed our personal responsibility. Now, am I trying to say we're not responsible? Of course not, because each of us has a role to play. But our role as individuals is not to save the world or save ourselves as individuals. Our role is to plug into our society and change the world for everybody so everybody can make those choices. And, and I noticed, ripple, um, right? Our job is to ripple. <laughs> yeah, to ripple. Our job is to ripple, exactly, to ripple and to cast a shadow. And I'm going to actually put the link to the climate shadow concept because I did not actually come up with that word. I think it's absolutely brilliant, but it was a really good journalist called Emma Patty who came up with that. So I'm going to put Emma's original article in the chat here. Um, if you're interested. So think of, yeah, think of that ripple effect. Think of that shadow effect. And if, think about this. This is really cool. We are still standing in the shadow of people who, got, who went before us. You and I both have, you know, graduate degrees. We work at universities. We are allowed to vote. Well, you know what? 150 years ago, most women, there was no way for them to get graduate degrees. They sure, certainly couldn't work as professors and they couldn't vote. <laughs> So we're standing in the shadow of people who have gone before us today, and we don't even know the names of most of those people. And that's why it's so powerful to, you know, people often ask me, well, how many people's minds have you changed on climate change? And being a scientist, I have definitely done experiments in the classroom to see if I'm being effective, because if I'm not, I would quit. That isn't what I should be doing, right? Our time is the most non-renewable resource we have. Carbon's number two, time's number one. So I've done experiments and I follow all the social science literature on best messaging practices, on what's holding people back, on understanding motivated reasoning and um, understanding the biases and the frames we bring to the table. And I talk about a lot of that in my book. In fact, my book is only like one chapter climate science in terms of the physical science and the rest of it's more about how we as humans interact with this information and what we can do to help fix the problem. So I follow all of that, but I don't track like, you know, notches on the belt. I don't track how many people because that's not up to me, right? Everybody makes their own decision and all I can do is what I can do, which is not controlling other people, not forcing other people, not, you know, keeping tabs. All I can do is keep dropping those stones while the ripples spread out. All I can do is keep casting that shadow and some people will choose never to listen. Some people will, will listen partly, but never decide to do anything. But I know, because I've seen this happen so many times, that when we realize we can make a difference, that's when we decide to add our hand to that giant boulder that, as I say, is already rolling down the hill in the right direction. It just needs more hands on it. Absolutely. Yeah, that's great. That's really helpful. Um, thanks for that discussion. I, I, we have so many questions uh, from great uh, audience members, participants and such. So I'd love to spend uh, the remaining time we have together going through those uh, if we can. So um, let's get to one that we have several upvotes on on our, on our little um, polling software here. So the question that has come in is, I feel like climate deniers uh, or dismissives have a much harder persuasion job than us, and yet they're able to persuade people. What kind of tactics do they use and how can we counter them? Similarly, what are we doing wrong when it comes to our communications that we can learn from? From them? That's a great question. <laughs> so um, I actually, I don't think they have a harder persuasion job. <laughs> I think that what they're doing is they're telling people what they want to hear. 
It's not real. It's not us. It's not bad. We don't have to fix it. Or, and this is a new one, but just equally as important, it's too late, so there's nothing you can do anyways. Yeah. Now, all of those might sound different, and people often celebrate, oh, a politician now says it's real and it might be humans. Or they say it's humans now, but they don't support, you know, climate action. And we sort of celebrate that as if they sort of advanced, but they didn't because every single one of those is aimed at the same goal, which is no action. And as long as you're saying something that, you know, whether it's it's not real or whether there's nothing we can do about it, the goal is the same, no action. So keeping people from doing anything is actually easier because most people don't want to change. Change is frightening, especially in a world that is changing so quickly already in front of our eyes. Many people are just clinging to what they've had and they feel like it's slipping through their fingers like sand at the beach. And so when they're told, oh, those people are just alarmists and they're wrong and they're, you know, doing this, then people are like, oh, okay, so I don't have to do anything. Woo, that's all right. And so they, they look for that. Then there's also the problem that we're becoming increasingly polarized. Now, I live in the United States, where in the United States for the last five or six years, it's been more politically polarized since the Civil War. And the United States is more politically polarized than any other country. But it's been been leaking across the border. If you look at a map of our last election results, and then you look at a map of, of, you know, who says climate is changing due to human activities, the geographic patterns are very similar. Striking. <laughs> Striking. Striking, yes. <laughs> and so there's also this issue of our group. I want to be part of our group, and our group thinks this. We support this. We don't like this. We're opposed to this. And climate change is part of our group. And so as we become more and more divided as a society, then the people who are in the group who tend to say, oh, you know, I don't want to act on climate – they are much more receptive and susceptible to these arguments because it fulfills and re- reinforces their identity. So, so what type of tactics do they use? Well, they use a whole playbook of tactics. And I have a whole course I teach on, on these tactics. It's really, really interesting. So, so there's, there's a, a couple of tactics. One is, first of all, um, uh, fake experts. You know, here's Dr. So-and-so that says this, and we saw this with COVID in spades, right? We saw so-and-so put on a white lab coat and made a YouTube video, and all of a sudden they know more than Dr. Fauci and the CDC and and Teresa Tam and all the rest of the experts that we have. We see this a lot in climate change as well. Then there's cherry picking. It's cold outside today where I live, so therefore the entire planet cannot be warming over climate timescales, which is the average of 20 to 30 years. Then there's impossible expectations. Oh, so you think we should fix climate change? What do you think your phone is made of? Where does your electricity come from? (laughs) You know, you have to be 100% pure, which means living off the grid in the Yukon, right? You have to be 100% pure before you can ever say that we need to change the system. Now, of course, if you're flying around in a private jet eating like, you know, huge steaks for every meal um, and, and, you know, living in a giant McMansion with all the lights burning all the time and old incandescent bulbs too, <laughs> then, then of course you're not living according to what you're saying. But mm-hmm. we have to recognize, like you were saying, we live in this system where we have to change the system and we have to be part of the system in order to change the system. If there's something wrong at your school, do you boycott your school or do you double down and invest and engage and say, let's change this. I'm going to be a voice for change. I'm going to use my voice to advocate for change, bring other people around and change. We have a choice. And when we engage in the system, that's the only chance we have to actually change that system. So, so fake experts, cherry picking, impossible expectations. What other techniques have you seen that they use? And then we'll get to what, what we should be doing. Yeah. Um, well, I, I, I definitely see trust or calling into question um, trust as sort of a, as a key tactic. And I, I certainly saw this evolve. You'll have seen it more intimately than I, but in the US over the last four years, when you don't know who to go to for good information, because the sort of trust rug has been pulled out from under you, that, mm-hmm. that scientists have been co-opted and the media is no longer trustworthy. And there's just nowhere to go for there are, there are lots of places to go, but if you feel like there's nowhere to go where you can get 
your head around what's happening. Um, it sort of leads to this feeling of being, you know, at, at sea and and unable to kind of get your bearings and know what what um, the next steps are. So, I definitely see calling into question, you know, the expertise of of those who are pretty pretty up to speed on the issue as a, as a tactic. Um, there's a lot of kind of whataboutism and false comparisons between issues that can um, that can also lead to kind of confused logic around what who's doing what and is this actually worse than this and you know that kind of thing. So the the um, false comparisons I find are are pretty toxic. Um, I do think the climate nihilism one the sort of the the arguments from from within the house so to speak um, are are particularly challenging and and new um, and I'm seeing that you know it's been a for any of you who have been watching the news it's been a tragic um, week in the climate activism space um, and and I think when events like like what has happened, I'll, I'll let you Google it. And it's quite, uh, it's quite distressing. So if you want to learn more about um, what's been happening in the climate activism space, you can, you can have a look. But when there are really extreme acts that are undertaken as sort of the final call, the final plea for help, it really, it really does convey this sense that this problem is too big. And so we should just, you know, um, direct our attention elsewhere and live a good life while we can and this kind of thing. And I just think, in my view that you know it, that couldn't be further from the truth of what's needed to to solve the problem and with all due respect i feel like the the don't look up movie on netflix that probably a lot of people have seen it plays right into that yeah i agree it's it's supposed to be a satire but some parts of it are all too painfully true about how society is just fascinated with the shiny cat toys of celebrity gossip rather than the, what scientists are saying that we need to act now if we're going to avoid our own destruction. Um, but it fails to show how we can make a difference. And, and this sort of addresses one of the other questions here, which is, um, just a second here, um, where did that question go? Um, the, que the question about, uh, oh, you, you all, um, it isn't as upvoted as anymore. Um, the, que the question about how do we communicate the risks Yeah. Um, in a way that actually motivates people to act. And right. the answer to that is we have to communicate the risks because otherwise if there's no risks, why do anything, right? But we have to at the same time, in the same breath, so to speak, as possible, with equal or even greater emphasis, communicate the solutions and how each of us can contribute. Mm -hmm. It's like two sides of the coin. You have to do both at the same time. You flip the coin, you see the risks, but when it lands, it lands on the solutions. And so I actually helped Netflix create a website to go with Don't Look Up nice. afterwards. They didn't ask me when they were creating the movie. Otherwise, I would have said, actually, I would have said, okay, sure, make the movie, but then restart it halfway through and then show how individual actions created this ripple effect that completely altered the outcome show that too late for that apparently leonardo dicaprio was already on to his next project <laughs> so instead <laughs> i helped them create a website called don't look up count us in and i put it in the chat here so let's see is it is it still here um it's above climate shadow oh here it is i'll copy it and paste it again and it's really an effective way to say how can we as individuals make a difference how can we engage um it's not about just sort of looking up to the sky and saying we're doomed. It's about realizing, okay, there's a serious risk. Yes, of course there is. And we have to convey that accurately and truthfully. But at the same time, we also have to show how we can make a difference because otherwise we see all of these defense mechanisms kick in that we, we started off talking about. They either, oh, I'm just gonna go back to bed and pull the covers up over my head, eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die, or I'm gonna control everything that I do, everything around me, and if anybody breaks my 10 commandments of green living, I will unleash the fires of righteous judgment on their head. And right. I can tell you all that accomplishes is they just avoid you and keep on yeah. doing the same thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. No, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, it, it's funny, and there's lots more questions here that we need to get to, but I wonder if you're having a similar experience because I know that you focus, uh, as in this conversation, so much around hope, but in the, 
in the couple of weeks of coverage of the, the IPCC report, there were a couple of key messages that came out of that that were so powerful. And the one that you know the UN and the IPCC said, you must convey this and don't soften it. You have to soften that emissions over the last 10 years were the highest they've been in human history. You can't say it any other way, this is the truth. And you also have to say that without immediate and deep action in all sectors and regions, that goal of 1.5 degrees of warming, limiting warming to 1.5 or even two degrees is beyond reach. And they said explicitly, don't make that easier. Don't make, you know, don't say um, it's possible that we'll stay within 1.5, say that it's beyond reach unless we do extreme stuff. However, the flip side of the, the report was saying, we have solutions now that are working and we have evidence that the solutions are working for the first time ever, like accumulated years and years of evidence that they're working for the first time ever. And when I put those two messages together, when I was you know, talking in the media about it and whatever, the journalists tended to gravitate actually towards the hope message and drop the, the, the truth telling part. And then I saw this caricature emerge of me as the, the ultimate climate op optimist, you know, and I don't know if you've, you've faced that and like how hard it is to make sure that both messages <laughs> stay and are heard instead of just one side of the coin. It's a tough one. Oh my goodness. Yes. <laughs> I mean, it's like a tight rope. And yeah. if you go one millimeter towards one side or the other, you get shot at by friendly fire because that's our people's reaction to feeling this complete lack and loss of control and efficacy and agency. Yeah. Um, and so, so, so how do we get that? Something that we haven't talked about yet is the whole idea of practice. We tend to think that p things need to be delivered to us on a silver platter or our iPhone screens. But what is delivered to us is to a certain extent chosen by us through algorithms that are tailored to what we click on. But to a large, ex a much larger extent, and if you've watched The Social Dilemma, you know what I'm talking about, it is determined by profit. Not our profit, by all the company's profits. Mm -hmm. And this is not new. You know, advertising has a long history of manipulation, but today it's like it's reached peak manipulation. And what keeps us clicking is not the hopeful stories. What keeps us clicking is the doom, the gloom, the despair, the frustration, the anger, the partisanship, the polarization, the, oh, I can't believe they did that. I can't believe they said that. What idiots they are. Makes you feel good temporarily, but then you need that next hit. Mm -hmm. And so they're, setting our minds is a part of this, of climate action that I feel like we don't discuss very much, of mm -hmm. making conscious decisions to go out and look for hopeful information, and share it with others, to go out and practice hopeful actions and then share what we're doing with others, mm -hmm. to really encourage others to say, you might need a little break. Let me take your hand on the boulder and push extra hard for a bit, or let's work together to bring more people's hands. That concept of practice in a world where everything is literally fed to us on a screen, I haven't seen much discussion of that at all. What do yeah. you think? Yeah, no, no, I think you're right. I think you're right. And it's certainly true that the sensationalized news is what gets the gets the views. Um, mm -hmm. I hope, I wonder if that's shifting, you know, I wonder if, if the message, you know, this overwhelming sort of fear and anxiety around climate change is also reaching a peak wherein people are like, okay, <laughs> I need to give me a breath and, and tell me what's working so that I can actually see that in real life and, and do it for myself. I, I hope that that's shifting and there's, I, I do see a hunger certainly in every single conversation I have around this for real solutions and evidence of what's working, even if it's not enough, even if it's not fast enough, that's okay. You know, I think um, the solutions are what matter. So we've talked a little bit, I'd like to get, get to one of these heavily upvoted comments here. We, we've mentioned children in passing, um, but I, I want to come back to how specifically to guide and empower children um, and, and keeping them uh, hopeful in the face of rapid climate change. So what are the strategies that you use when, when you're engaging with a more youthful audience on, on this issue? Well, first of all, kids are awesome. I think the best audience I've ever had was a bunch of third graders. <laughs> they, I mean, they just completely oh, yeah. got it. They understood <laughs> everything, yes. <laughs> And they don't know the meaning of no or can't do it or, oh, that's just not the way things are. Um, so kids are absolutely phenomenal. And with kids, of course, most kids already understand we have a problem. And what kids need to know just as much as the rest of us is they can make a difference. 
So I have this little series called Global Weirding. We're actually going to put out our fifth and final season shortly. I was just in talking to the producer yesterday about it, which I'm very excited about. And we have one episode that's called, and it's a frequently asked question I get, I'm just a kid, what can I do? And actually, I'll put that episode here in the chat. And I've been putting some other episodes for, for parents and kids in the chat here too, if you're interested. So we made this episode, what can kids do? And I thought, well, it's a frequently asked question. Let me go out and find what kids are doing. Because, you know, obviously there's, there's the children's climate strikes, but there's, you know, there must be more. Oh my goodness. I mean, I could make an entire series of YouTube videos about the incredible things kids are doing. And when I went to COP26 in Glasgow, the most hopeful aspect of it for me was seeing how kids and young voices were involved in almost every aspect, whether it was um, serving, there's you know a youth advisory panel for the United Arab Emirates Climate Action Plan, which completely blew me away. There's youth advisory panels for major corporations. There's young people who are making inventions for clean energy or who are changing policy or investing in, in their city. I mean, kids are just absolutely phenomenal. And I even met one who I'd only met before on Facebook. We've been interacting on my Facebook page for many years, a guy called Dion uh, from Africa. And, you know, he's, he shows up for our live global wording chats and comments on posts. And so I knew who he was and we've chatted online, you know, via the comment section. And so I went to this dinner at COP and it was the one dinner I wasn't speaking at. And oh my gosh, my, my schedule at COP was insane because as you know, I only travel when I bundle. So you, I have to have enough events in one place to actually travel. Well, mm -hmm. I think at COP I outdid myself. I think I counted 55 oh my <laughs> in <God>. total. <laughs> a lot. <laughs> I was just running. Like I had to wear comfy shoes because I was literally running the entire day from 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. So there was this dinner where um, it was a one time when I wasn't speaking and I sort of RSVP'd out of optimistic, <laughs> optimistic, not hopeful <laughs> thoughts that, oh, it would be nice to have a great dinner with interesting people. Yeah. I get to the end of the day, I just feel like falling face first, right? But I thought, you know, I signed up, they're going to have like an empty table food waste. <laughs> I'm not going to let that happen. <laughs> so I walked into this room and I saw this person across the room and his face just lit up when he saw me. He came running over. He's like, are you Dr. Hayhoe? I said, yes. And he says, I'm Dion. I'm like, oh, you're Dion. <laughs> and he said, you know why I'm here? He said, I never knew about climate change before I just sort of ran into your Facebook page. And I've started to follow all your posts. I've watched all your global weirding episodes. I understand now that climate change is a threat multiplier. And I'm paraphrasing here. I didn't memorize exactly what he said. But I understand it's a threat multiplier. And we can't fix any of the other issues that we have. We can't achieve the United Nations sustainability goals that are so essential for most low-income countries that without, or for all of us, really, without fixing climate change. So I became a country delegate to for our country to the negotiations wow and he he is a young person as well i mean young people are incredible so teach your kids that they can make a difference um show them our global reading episode on kids go to sciencemoms.com where it's got all kinds of helpful information on how to talk about climate change to your kids read the, the great book how to talk to your kids about climate change by harriet sugarman Kids are fantastic. And if we could just put them in charge of the world a little quicker, I think we'd, it would be a better place. <laughs> but in the meantime, what we can do is we can empower them, we can give them agency, and we can tell them that, yes, they can make a difference. So so this is fascinating to me because I'm of two minds on this issue, honestly. I mean, I think um, I'm so inspired by the energy of children and the um, the creativity of children and and how much change so many of them are making. But I also feel like those are mighty tiny shoulders to put this on, you know, and I, um, I worry that, you know, given the urgency of the issue, it's people our age who are currently in positions of power in companies, in government, and this kind of thing that need to make choices really fast. And I, so I actually struggle with this message that, that I, I think, um, I want to say to my own child, I want to say, we're taking care of it. <laughs> like everything that you do is, is powerful and important and do all you can and talk to your friends, but we're taking care of it. So I, you know, I am actually divided on, on, um, on the role that kids could and should play. Well, if I could take what you said and paraphrase it a bit, because I completely yeah. agree it should not be on their shoulders. Yeah. And I, w I was doing an event recently with a ninth grader from Indiana who was part of a team of high school students who wrote legislation for the Indiana State Legislature on climate action because nobody else was writing it. Wow. And they did a 
phenomenal job. They educated themselves on how you do it. They wrote it and then they educate themselves on the role that committees serve. And you know, I don't have any, I never took a class in American governance, so I'm learning too. On the role that you have to get it into committee and then you have to lobby the members of the committee and then these are how many people you have to get on board. I mean, they were absolutely phenomenal and so impressive and so encouraging. But he said something, which I think is, reflects what you're saying. And I, I feel this too. He said, this isn't our job. Yeah. The reason we're doing this is because the adults didn't do it. Because you're not, yeah. yeah. And so what, what I would say to our kids, to my kids, to your kids, to all of our kids is, it's our responsibility to fix it and you can help. Yeah, yeah. I think that's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, there's, there's nothing worse than disempowering children. And the truth is that they have some of the, you know, they, they don't think within the same constraints as adults, which is a beautiful thing, right? The solutions they come up with are really open and expansive and there's so much inspiration there. So I, I agree with you, it's a, it's a team effort. Um, okay, let's go back to another question here. Uh, speaking of 55 events <laughs> during COP, let's talk about burnout, Catherine. Um, I know where you're going. I can see that question right here. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and, and somebody's, at, somebody's asking too about, um, just in the chat, yeah. this is being recorded. If mm -hmm. you want to ask questions or upvote them, the link will be posted in the chat again. It's pollev.com slash Catherine. And all of these resources that are in the chat can be saved and they can be sent out via email afterwards, I think, right? Right. Okay. Yes. Right. I'll say yes to that. Absolutely. Okay. All right. So Good. go ahead. Burn yeah. it. Oh, uh, <laughs> so 55 events during COP and, and so much before and after it continuously. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, I'm sure you, um, for your own, in your own situation, but also all of the climate uh, leaders uh, in various sectors in civil society, the activists, the decision makers, the scientists, are all kind of grappling with this and the greater the fever pitch of attention and urgency, the, the more risky this is. So the question is how do we fight burnout in sustainability leaders who are fighting against climate change? Well, this is a very real question because we all feel the urgency of this. We're not doing this to earn a paycheck, we're doing this to save ourselves, as I put it, as the title of my book literally says. So. When you think about the weight of what's on, you think, how can I stop? How can I not do everything I can? And like I said, our time is the most non-renewable resource we have, but our energy is renewable. But in order to be renewable, we have to renew it. <laughs> Otherwise it is not. Yeah. And the way we have to think about it is, this is like an ultra marathon. It's not the hundred meters. And for the, for, for the ultra marathon, you have to pace yourself or else you will burn out. And if you burn out, you will not be any good to anyone. So what we have to do, and this is really hard because this is not the way we're sort of socialized, I feel like. We have to realize that prioritizing doing what we love, where we love, with the people we love is climate action. Because what that do, is doing is it's showing us what, what we're fighting for. It's reminding us why this matters so much. It's recharging our tanks by being outside in nature, um, playing with the kids, you know, having a family night, <laughs> watching a silly movie, um, going somewhere that we love that just makes us think how unique and precious this world is and how important it is to preserve it. But it's a challenge that we're feeling everywhere. So I'm the chief scientist for the Nature Conservancy and it is a mission-driven organization. Its goal is quite literally to conserve the land, air, and water on which all life depends, all of it. And tackling climate change is one of their absolute top priorities, as well as addressing the biodiversity crises, the two twin crises of climate and biodiversity, because without that, we, you know, will not survive. And I don't mean the human race, I just mean our society, the way that we live, nothing of that will survive. So um, a lot of people are just so burned out from COVID, from juggling illness, from, you know, the long lasting effects of COVID on, on many people, um, from having our kids, I mean, you know, in Ontario, it's like another lockdown and the kids are at home again. And if you have any like elementary or preschool age, you're just like, this is not, I just can't survive. How am I supposed to work and do all this important work? How am I supposed to care for my family? How am I supposed to do this? How am I supposed to do that? And so we see massive amounts of burnout across our organization and across the whole community. And it's not because people are cracking the whip. It's because we're cracking the whip at ourselves. We're, you know, we're sort of, again, socialized to feel like we can do it all. And the reality is being kind to ourselves. And I love, 
the Don't Look Up Count Us In website, one of the personal actions it has there is be kind to your mind. Being kind to ourselves and spending that time reminding ourselves of who we love, what we love, and where we love is climate action. And so scheduling that into your day. So when you go, go full out. I don't waste a minute or an ounce of carbon when I'm going. I just got back from Utah where I think in, in six days, no, in seven days, and one was a full day event, I had 30 events. Wow. And then I got home and I slept nine hours and then I took a morning nap and then I took an afternoon nap. <laughs> um, but but scheduling that time to to just, again, to recharge your own batteries. Yeah. I'm not going to say gas tank, batteries. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. To recharge your own batteries, to, um, to, to invest in people around you. Um, that's how we fight that burnout and recognizing. So recognizing, number one, it's not an ultra marathon, or, or sorry, it's not a hundred meter dash, it's an ultra marathon. Number two, caring for yourself is a climate action. And number three, we're all in this together. We're not alone. There's millions of hands on that boulder. And if you need to take your hand off for a bit and take a break, it's okay. Somebody else has it. Yeah, absolutely. No, I think you're right. And I think, you know, you, you referenced the, the COVID um, related stress as well. And I think it is important to recognize that this is a wildly unusual time that, you know, those, those of us working in the climate change and sustainability arena are like everyone else coming off of the last couple of years of of intense ups and downs from COVID. And so, you know, I'm finding personally that that the buffer that I would have had pre-COVID has been worn away, right? The resilience that you that you had, the sort of well to, to draw from is worn away because of the ins and outs and the caregiving and the, you know, and just like watching COVID unfold takes a toll um, to say nothing of those who've actually gotten ill and, and taken care of others. So that is real and that's colliding with this frenzied urgency around climate change. So I think um, it's a really powerful message to, to take a step back and um, recharge so that you, know, you can come at this again. And I also find that um, as bizarre as it is, humility helps because I don't, because when I reflect on my own importance with some humility, I think it's really okay that, you know, I don't know that my specific actions or voice are directly leading from X to Y to some, you know, major impact. It's this collective emergent process. So I can rest um, because I know that I'm part of a bigger um, of a bigger effort. And I don't, and I'm sort of mysterious about, you know, whether or not my own actions or, or words have a real impact. So that helps me. The humility like, helps me take a step back for sure. I love that. You're totally right. Thinking that, you know, having that sort of savior complex, like I can save the world. None of us can save the world together, but, or individually, none of us can save the world individually, but together we can do it. And that means pacing each other like a relay team. Um, it's, it sort of reminds me of that, that, that diagram where what you should be doing, which is unique, because who you are, you have a different set of skills, interests, area of expertise, education, you live somewhere different, you're embedded in different circles. Think of that ripple effect where you work, where you live, organizations you're part of. It's the intersection of what needs to be done, and there's a lot that needs to be done, what you're particularly good at. So I get, and you probably do too, I get students often ask me, what should I study to make a difference on climate change? My answer is study whatever you love and whatever you're good at, because we need everybody. I work with people who have degrees in media, communications, and marketing. I work with people who have degrees in engineering. I work with people who have degrees in um, farming and agriculture and natural resources. People who have degrees in technical writing from English. People who have degrees in psychology and sociology. I work with artists. I work with visual artists. I work with artists who write. I work with artists who do performance art. I am in a political science department and I have degrees in physics, astronomy, and atmospheric science. <laughs> so, total sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And the, the latest book I wrote is pretty much all about the social science of climate change. So, what needs to be done, what you particularly are good at, and then, and this is, I think this directly addresses this question the third sphere that we never think about what gives you joy? Mm -hmm. is what keeps us in the ultra marathon of climate change, <laughs> fixing climate change, it's that joy. And so we have to cultivate that joy. We have to practice that joy. We have to invest in things that give us that joy. And right there in the center is our sweet spot. And that is how we stay in the center by not neglecting any of those three spheres. Yeah. 
Well, you bring to mind actually something that I really feel is missing from the, the climate conversation, which is that we've been told, you know, for, for decades, what we need to give up, what we need to move away from, what we need to stop doing. But it's not often that we can have a really fruitful conversation about what we want, you know, like what is it that we're pushing towards and what is the story of the future or the vision of the future that we're actually trying to attain in a positive way. And actually by reflecting on like, you know, I spend too much time in my car and I don't see my family enough. And why is it that I work such long hours? And those are things I'd actually be overjoyed <laughs> to part with. And, and so maybe there's a more sustainable way of living that would give me some of those things. And it's that vision of the future that um, can be different from person to person or community to community around the world, but is perhaps more mobilizing than all the things we have to sacrifice. I completely agree with you because if we're focusing on the doom, then it's hard to look away. It's like that comet coming at the earth. Our eyes are just glued to it. And if you're focusing on the comet coming to earth, so to speak, the impending doom of climate change, then it's hard to focus on what we're doing. And it invokes the wrong responses in our brain. Mm -hmm. One of the most interesting books I read was by a neuroscientist called Tali Sherrod. It's called The Influential Mind. I'll put a link in the chat in a minute. And it wasn't about climate change at all, but it was all about climate change <laughs> because it's all about how our brains are wired. And our brains are wired when we're confronted by fear. And of course, most of us are already worried about climate change. Many of us are anxious. Many of us are even panicked. When we're confronted by fear, our brains are literally wired to either have this surge of adrenaline, which helps us outrun the bear, mm -hmm. or outrun the person beside us, <laughs> which is what he may have learned at <laughs> summer camp. Um, don't do that, just to be clear. Grab the person beside you and run with them. But there's, there's the surge of adrenaline, or if it's this sort of long-term impending doom, paralysis. Our brain is literally wired to dissociate from that because we can't maintain that level of anxiety and still function. And that's exactly what we're seeing in society today. So by focusing on the doom, we're actually invoking either that knee-jerk reaction or the long-term paralysis, both of which will doom us. Isn't that ironic? Yeah, yeah. So, so how do we break that vicious cycle by focusing on what you just said, on what the better future looks like? and. I mentioned the book earlier by Christiana Figueres that she wrote after the Paris Agreement, which was absolutely phenomenal because it paints the most vivid picture I've seen of what that better future looks like. And I'll put the influential mind in here too in a, in a second. But paint the picture of that better future where yes, where we, we live in a walkable city with plants growing up the sides of buildings and all of, you know, green spaces and local food and um, you know, farmer's markets, and the easiest thing to do is to compost. The easiest thing to do is to buy food without plastic wrap on it. The easiest thing to do is to walk your kids to school rather than having to drive them or even put them on a bus. The, the easiest thing to do is the best thing to do, and the skies are blue, like we saw for, you know, a few weeks during lockdown. The skies are blue in some of the most polluted cities in the world. The water runs clear and you can swim in it without worrying about, you know, I grew up on the shores of Lake Ontario and my mother did not want us to put our toes in Lake Ontario when I was little. <laughs> you know, a, a world where life is better. And then what is climate change? Climate change is the hurdle that we need to jump, o get over to get to that better future. And so what are you doing? What they tell athletes to do, right? Visualize, visualize where you're going. Mm -hmm. Focus on the goal. And then do whatever you have to do to get to that goal. But that goal is what will keep you fighting. So when things are darkest, what saved people when things were darkest was focusing on that goal. Right. What, what do I want it to look like? And is there anything, anything that I can do to help? Because again, by myself, I can't do it. Is there anything I can do to help make yeah. that future real? Yeah. Well, it's so true. And I think climate change is, is a hurdle and it's also an opening. Like it's, it's also, you know, a real... I don't want to gloss it over, but it's an opportunity to have a really tough conversation about what's working and what's not. And, you know, and one, one of the main findings from the IPCC report also was that we can't possibly reach all of our sustainable development goals without dealing with climate change. It's a must. It runs through all of them. If you want zero poverty, if you want sustainable communities, if you want clean water, climate change has to be, um, has to be tackled in a real way. So it's an opening to have that conversation about what the future could look like. 
Um, speaking of sustainable development goals and sort of a more global perspective on, on the issue, one question uh, says, for the global north, hope can be a very different thing than in the global south. For developed countries, the worry may be real, but with access, uh, with more access to resources, how do you tackle the difference in challenges faced regarding hope for developing countries versus developed ones? How do you think about that? Oh my goodness, yes. I mean, to some extent, when you look at the massive difference between the resources that we use in high income countries versus low income countries, the fact that we are giving into despair to someone who literally cannot put food on the table and is considering selling one of their children as a child bride just so that the rest of them don't die of starvation seems like a luxury. Now, I'm not, I'm not disparaging that in any way because we live in this situation and this is a natural response. Our concern and anxiety is a natural and logical response to what we're seeing. But when we look at people who today are facing unthinkable choices, and not only in low-income countries, but just you know what's happening in countries like Ukraine, which, as I said before, um, and as Ukrainian scientists have said very clearly, the war in Ukraine is very clearly linked to fossil fuel use. And fossil fuels are being used as a weapon in the war. Just today, the headlines were Russia's cutting off natural gas supplies to two of the countries that it feels like is unduly supporting Ukraine. So that, that again, is why our goal is a better world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the sustainable development goals, which are very basic, no poverty, no hunger, clean water for all, which some people don't even have in North America, just for the record, you know, it's, it's not, it's not just a, you know, over there, it's, we have it right here too. There are people going hungry right here. There are people who do not have shelter right here. And those people are most vulnerable to climate impacts and are contributing the least to it, living right here in our cities, as well as on the other side of the world. But when we look at those uh, sustainable development goals, number 13 is climate action. But again, hindsight of course, how it was being 2020, if they'd asked me, <laughs> I would have said, take it out because why is climate action even on that list? The only reason we care about climate change is because it affects poverty, health, food, water, access to basic health care, to quality education, gender and racial equity. All of these issues are being exacerbated by climate change. We cannot solve them. Climate change is the hole in their bucket. We cannot solve them if we don't solve climate change. So I would take number 13 out and I would put it as a banner across the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And I would say, here's the hurdle that stands in our way. And here, the sustainable development goals are the better future that we're going to. Yeah. Yeah. So, so in less developed countries, we need win-win-win solutions urgently. Solutions that tackle resilience and adaptation and mitigation and provide food and clean water and deal with issues like sanitation that we often don't think about at all. So in the, my book, uh, Saving Us, some of my favorite stories were, and again, this could be a whole book, were stories of what's happening where, you know, a company in India is, or a nonprofit in India is providing free access to sanitation. And that basically means toilets. Mm -hmm. And it's taking the human waste and turning it into biogas and using it to power electricity. Yeah. I mean, talk about a win, 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 because um, water pollution leads to massive amounts of disease that especially affects young children. I think mm -hmm. this is something like 5 million young children under the age of five die from waterborne diseases. Mm -hmm. um, and you're also creating a source of energy for pe electricity for people who don't have it. And electricity is highly correlated with human well-being, electricity specifically, not energy in general. Yeah. Um, and of course, um, you're creating a net carbon neutral source of energy because the, the, the carbon that's being released was taken out of the atmosphere relatively recently within the last year due to all of the plants and things that we ate. That's where it comes right. from. Yeah. Um, and then um, Solar Sister, you know, an organization that's empowering women in sub-Saharan Africa. And of course, investing in women and girls is one of the biggest, uh, is a big climate solution, one of my favorite solutions, to be totally honest. But it's empowering them to be entrepreneurs to sell solar powered technology. And then um, one story I didn't even know about until I wrote my book was a guy called Tony Renato. He's an agronomist from Australia who works with World Vision. And he realized that if we plant if you plant trees around and within fields, they retain water and nutrients and provide um, help, help the crops be more drought resistant. So over 40 years, this one man worked patiently with farmers across Sub-Saharan Africa, encouraging them, you know, one person and then talking about it and getting their neighbors to do it and then spreading the word and getting a few more people to do it, then moving over to the next area and getting a few of them to start doing it, you know, dropping that stone, the ripples spreading out. 
And so now it's to the point where there was some phenomenal number, and I'm going to misquote it, but it was a huge phenomenal number. And I feel like it was something on the order of 250 million more people are being fed because of the trees that he encouraged people to plant. And of course, trees take up carbon too. So that's why they're a climate solution. And they also, of course, make agriculture more resilient too. And again, don't quote me on that because it was it was a large number and that sticks in my head, but I can't remember quite quite what it was. But just for one person to have that ripple effect was phenomenal. And so we need these solutions. And that's why the Paris Agreement is not just Here's what all the high emitting countries have to do to cut their emissions, which is what we focus on so much in Canada and the US. But the bigger part of the Paris Agreement, bigger in the sense that it actually addresses many more countries, many more countries. In fact, the majority of countries fall into the second part. Low and middle income countries can benefit from the Green Climate Fund. Mm -hmm. And that's a fund to support um, development of resilience and mitigation plans. And the next COP coming up this fall, COP27, is going to specifically address loss and damage because we're starting as scientists to be able to put numbers on just how much climate ch worse climate change made a given flood or hurricane or cyclone, and even numbers on how much more the financial losses were because of climate change supersizing these events. And so we can see very clearly that the people suffering the impacts, whether it's a low-income neighborhood in Houston, Texas, or a drought in Madagascar, Though they are bearing the brunt of the impacts, yet they have done almost nothing to contribute to the problem. And so facilitating that loss and damage is going to be the discussion at the next COP. And it's directly addressed at recognizing that low-income countries and low-income communities, even within high-income countries, are disproportionately suffering the impacts, yet have least access to the resilience, the planning, and the mitigation solutions. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. And I... I... Um, I think this really highlights a, a, um, an important progression in the climate change conversation over the last few years, which has been to uh, frame it as a justice issue as much as anything else. And, and that is both, as the questioner highlights, north, south, you know, wealthy, industrialized, and, um, and lower income countries, but also within countries, that is, a, it's a justice issue here within Canada. Um, that marginalized communities, communities who've been affected by, um, by racism or the legacy of colonialism, indigenous communities, for instance, are um, inevitably suffering more from, from the impacts of climate change and also excluded from really important conversations around what greenhouse gas reduction strategies are appropriate and what that mitigation that, you know, that um, path forward is on tackling the causes of climate change. So Internationally, I'm, you know, it's it, it'll be interesting to see the adaptation COP come up uh, next, you know, at the end of the year um, in Egypt. But it is important to, you know, to remember that that's been really underfunded and really undersupported, right? The the Green Climate Fund has been around since Cancun or whatever, you know, several many COPs ago it was created, and the promises that de rich developed countries have made to putting funds into that pot have almost never been met. And that is a really um, important aspect of, um, I think, making faster and more equitable progress going forward. I'm so glad you brought that up because we, um, as of COP26, I think there was only one country that had contributed what it had promised to the Green Climate Fund, and it was not Canada. No, no. And it was not the United States. No. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so glad you asked that or mentioned that, yes. Yeah, absolutely. So I think, um, and that is, you know, this also brings us to the, the question of a just transition. What does a just transition look like um, here in Canada and, and around the world? And, and sometimes we, that conversation focuses around ensuring that folks whose livelihoods are, are rooted in oil and gas, for instance, are transitioned from those jobs um, smoothly towards jobs in, in a renewable energy economy or whatever, but there are certainly broader issues related to the justice of climate change action that I think are a really important part of what we're talking about right now. Um, let's move on to another question. We have lots more going on here. Um, okay, so, so we spoke earlier about um, climate activism Let's tackle this question here that's specifically focused on that. Do you encourage climate activists to continue to raise their voices in the streets in nonviolent direct action? If so, do you recommend doing this in front of banks, financing fossil fuels, or in front of government offices? Which is most effective in your opinion? It's a tricky one. Oh, well, I recommend raising our voices. Uh, where, remember that intersection? So what needs to be done 
what we particularly have the ability, skills, interest in doing, and what gives us joy. That's where we we intersect. And so the answer to pretty much all of the above, as long as something is not, as long as something is not something that actually turns people off and prevents more climate action than it causes, my answer is yes. As long as it's not, you know, actively harming people and I can't, I really don't support judging individual people and their choices. It's one thing if it's the CEO of some of the richest companies in the world, but if it's your neighbor who has a gas powered lawnmower and you read them the absolute riot act, as opposed to saying gently, hey, did you know? Um, using our voice in every way I think is really important. So for example, let's, let's pick um, a big corporation. How can we use our voices? Well, first of all, how do big corporations change often when people within the organization use their voices? Mm -hmm. Why does Amazon have a climate strategy? It's not because Jeff Bezos woke up one morning and decided they had to have a climate strategy. It's because he couldn't ignore the voices anymore of people who worked for Amazon. Yeah. Then who else do they listen to? Their shareholders. And so if you're interested in an interesting story, look up engine number one and Exxon, where they deliberately, rather than divesting, they bought Exxon shares in order to be able to show up at the stakeholder meeting and force them to adopt a, a climate resolution. But then there's also the opposite, uh, which is divesting, which is deliberately de-investing. De and this is really effective if you're part of a pension fund, um, as well as your own private savings, um, where you can, and the university, of course, with its endowments, a lot of universities are doing this. We can say, we're going to actually pull out the money that we have invested in the fossil fuel industry is something that people do. Um, and then um, there's the direct activism where you are outside with a sign picketing, um, which definitely raises awareness and gets headlines. And then there's the activism where, you know, I, I realized I had a credit card from the bank that's the number one funder of fossil fuels around the world. And so not only did I cut up the credit card and cancel it, but I called them. I told them why I was canceling it. And they said, all banks do this. I'm like, well, A, not all banks. And B, you're the worst. <laughs> I'm not asking for purity, but I am saying. <laughs> Better. Yes. Yeah. Um, and then I shared it on social media to let right. other people know what I did and why I did it. So there's so many different ways to use our voices. And if, if um, let's see the, the way that they phrased it, um, if, if, that ra if raising your voices in the street in nonviolent direct action is what you do best, then please do it because you are bringing attention to this issue. Um, consider inviting a few people to join you. They might not be sure about it, but you could be like, okay, well, here's what we're doing. And you know, you can stand over there, but you know, it's just great to have more bodies. And then before you know it, they'll be right there beside you. <laughs> we need everybody doing everything. There is no right or wrong thing. We just need everything. Yeah. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I do think that this is, you know, I, I had this conversation at length. I have my, I have uh, weekly team meetings with my graduate students or biweekly uh, with my PhD and master's students just to check in and see how everyone's doing. And we were talking about this just yesterday about where they stand on their own sort of um, their own perspective on climate activism in particular. And if that's where they see their energy best being used or if they see their skills um, having an effect in a different sector. And I, and I thought we arrived at a really nice and you know inclusive place where we recognize that, that for some, that is a pathway to action. That is a pathway to community as well, to connecting with folks with, with aligned values and to, to feeling empowered and sending a signal. But it is not the path for everyone, nor does it need to be. And I, I think, you know, you can be truly devoted to this issue and knowledgeable about this issue and affecting change within, you know, the, the workplace that you have or within your family or your kid's school or your neighborhood association or, or whatever. And those are really powerful pathways to action. So, um, and we, we do have to decide we have limited energy, which we can recharge as we've discussed and limited time. So, um, you do for me personally, I really honor and respect the, um, climate activism that unfolds and occasionally I'm part of it more often than not. I focus my energy on what are they calling for? It has to happen somewhere. Like it actually has to be done in, in government, in municipal, provincial, federal government. The science has to be done to answer the questions that are being asked. Um, and those are, you know, those are roles that I'm able to play, but, but not everybody is. So I, I think it's, um, I think an expansive idea of how to engage in the issue is the best way to sustain our energy for sure. Oh, yes. And, and in our science community, I often get asked, you know, what should, a, what should 
as scientists do? And yeah. my answer is there's an entire spectrum because between people who do the peer reviewed studies, publish the peer reviewed studies and stay firmly in the ivory tower um, versus people who are, you know, chaining themselves to public buildings right. or corporations. There's this whole range and where you fall is an individual decision based on where you are in your life at that time and what you can, can contribute. And where you are will move over time, but there's no should because we're all moving to the same direction. We're all going to that better future. And we need the people doing the research, right? Yeah. We need the yeah. people doing the applied research, interacting with others across sectors. We mm -hmm. need the people who share the research and communicate the research. We need people who inform policymakers and decision makers. We need people who get on social media. We need people who write the op-eds. We need people who circulate the letters. We need people who engage in um, peaceful protests. We need people all across the entire spectrum. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so that's that's a great point. Let's um let's talk about connections between issues again because I think that this is a helpful way to grow that big tent that we're all um you know in if we're if we're tackling this together. So there is a question um that interestingly connects this to the housing and affordability crisis. So this is really front of mind, especially given uh, inflation and um, these very costly times we live in. So the question is alongside the climate crisis hitting closer and closer to home in Canada, we have a housing and affordability crisis. Talking to friends and family, um, it is this suddenly critical issue that is taking everyone's time, energy, and attention. And we're about to come up to a provincial election here in, in Ontario. So there's a lot of talk about what the dominant issues are, certainly. Um, I'm unsure how or if to pivot amidst these connected issues. So how do you view, um, what's your approach when, when an issue like housing affordability or say, you know, the conflict in Ukraine, the war in Ukraine, when something, you know, sort of rears up and swallows the oxygen in the room, um, how do you connect to those issues? Yes. And, you know, I think this actually is directly to the question immediately above. So if you don't mind, I'm going to read that one yeah, too, because I think yeah. they go together. Um, and we only have a few more minutes. Left. I know we do. Oh, It'll yes. probably be our last set of questions. Yes. And so this one says, for people who are grappling with limited access to food, housing, healthcare, employment, how are they to rise above this life experience to make an impact on climate change? Are there limits on their ability to have an impact and a voice? Yes. And this relates to that whole thing that we were talking about before, the whole idea of it's individually on us. Mm -hmm. Well, if it's individually on us and it requires additional effort, like it's harder to do the right thing than not. It's more expensive to do the right thing than not. We're never gonna fix this because the people who are most affected have the least agency if it's all on us. But that's why it's so important to recognize that it isn't all on us individually. It is on all of us collectively together. And by using our voice, every single one of us, and we do have voices these days, whether you know it's in our local community, with our family, with our friends, the people who live in our building, the people who, you know, play with their kids in the same park, the church that we attend, the place that we work, we all have that voice. And what we have to recognize is that climate change is not a separate issue on our priority list that we can only afford to put up if we, you know, if we don't have to worry about all these other things. It's not on our priority list. Take climate change off your priority list. Instead, look at what you have at the top of your priority list. And then climate change affects every single one of those things already at the top of your priority list. And mm -hmm. so if you can't put enough food on the table to feed your kids and someone says, oh, well, you should be driving an EV. I mean, how do you feel about that? It's like I feel so fortunate to even have any type of vehicle at all. And half the time I can't even afford to put gas in it. And you're telling me that the only thing I can do is to buy this extremely expensive vehicle that's, you know, you know, used vehicles are not even that easy to find. Yeah. And I don't even have a plug in the apartment building where I live. I mean, it's just, it's the opposite of efficacy. Yeah, yeah. That's why we have to change the system. So the best choice is the easiest choice. The best choice is the cheapest choice. So everybody has the ability to make these choices and it makes everybody's life better today as well as tomorrow. And that's why voting is very important. So important. <laughs> yeah, you know, you're right. And I think when it comes to housing afford affordability as one of them, one of the dangers, um, if we don't think about the connections between issues is that we will price people out, for instance, of, of efficient housing, right? If we're moving towards, you know, if we're, if we're moving to, towards really efficient buildings and moving them off natural gas for heating and, and such, they can be then 
they can be, become so expensive that they're completely out of the realm of possibility for, for most folks, especially given escalating housing prices, same with electric vehicles. And so it becomes the sustainability of the rich, you know, only an option for people who have enormous uh, resources. And that absolutely doesn't solve the problem. So then that I think that does come back to policy and to government decisions to, to make these, um, to make sure that progress on climate change doesn't come at the cost of of food security and safety and livelihoods for everyone. And I think this is very timely because I think I just saw a headline like yesterday, the day before stating that the average home in Canada is twice as much as the average home in the US. Is it really? Yes, and okay, funny. I'm gonna make a climate <laughs> connection here. <laughs> I think that there's a serious danger of this problem actually getting worse as climate change intensifies. Because mm -hmm. Canada is a relatively northern country with relatively abundant water resources and agricultural land. And when you look at where in the world people could move to, to, you know, and, and don't get me wrong, climate impacts on Canada are severe and significant. I'll be very clear about that. But when you look at whether it's long term, somebody living in Phoenix, Arizona, Miami, Florida, New York City, or Toronto is going to be better off. If you just look at it objectively, Toronto is the clear winner from that, <laughs> those four choices. And so there have been books written as long as 20 years ago, and there have been many newspaper articles literally talking about where should you move to avoid climate change or not, you can't avoid it anywhere, but where should I move to, you know, so that we're still sort of, you know, life can function under climate change. And yeah. Canada is on people's list. Um, and so unfortunately, it's like a glorified version of the final scene and don't look up where this, um, and I'm sorry if you haven't seen it, <laughs> I won't tell all the good parts, I'll just tell this part, where this ultra rich person has this really great spaceship and only his buddies and people that he thinks are worth saving, which of course are not the people most affected, go into the spaceship to be saved. Um, and so it's a completely, you know, um, elitist, like the people who have the resources can move somewhere where they can still, you know, get a job or support themselves and feed their family and be in better circumstances. But the people who can't, can't. I mean, the migration of people in Central America into the United States over the southern border that has been tied to climate change exacerbating the geopolitical instability and the resource crises in those areas. Climate mm -hmm. change is already contributing to uh, the flows of, of, of refugees, whether it's exacerbating the Syrian drought, whether it's inundating you know, low-lying islands in the South Pacific, or whether it's massive amounts of drought in, in Mexico and Central America, we're already seeing that refugee crisis happening and it is only gonna intensify. And we, we, we welcome refugees, and that's something that makes me so proud to be a Canadian. Um, but even we cannot cope with the flood that is to come if we don't tackle climate change. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for those reflections. Um, we're nearing the end of our time, so I, I wanted to take just a moment before we wrap up um, to just to, to pull out a couple of threads that I found particularly helpful or things that maybe we could consider, you know, keep on noodling over and, and uh, working on as we move back into our, our lives and um, uh, livelihoods. And so for, so for me, what I really appreciate from this conversation is that um, hope means coming to terms with the reality, the truth of the situation. So hope does not mean, you know, keeping that at bay and pretending that the climate crisis isn't urgent and that this isn't real and that this isn't serious, um, which takes some work and that's, that's effort and that's um, you know, a, a really challenging thing to do. But we come to terms with the urgency of the challenge, but we also see these openings, we see and, and appreciate and perhaps focus our energy on the real evidence for solutions that are working, which is true, which are out there to be seen and learned from. You know, most of the technologies we need to do the, the majority of the heavy lifting and emissions reductions in the next 10 years already exist. The, the, the solutions are already there. Um, so I really appreciate that. I, I really appreciate the way we've talked about our individual responsibility relative to the collective task, you know, the, the working together on this, um, and especially your perspective on, on 
caring for yourself and your family and finding joy where you find joy as a way of contributing actually to, um, to the movement on climate change. So um, everybody feel, feel permission, <laughs> give yourself time and space and permission to find that joy um, so that you're recharged uh, to tackle this incredible challenge. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you to everyone for your uh, penetrating questions to Catherine for your great and thoughtful answers. Um, uh, thanks for spending all of this time today with, with our community. Um, I think for me, this has done a lot in shifting my attention away from the, the grim reality and the, the doom narrative towards um, the, the hope side of the equation. So um, if you'd like to learn more um, about climate change at the University of Waterloo, of course, there's a lot going on here. And I, I really welcome you all to reach out to me as well and the Interdisciplinary Center on Climate Change at uwaterloo.ca slash climate-center and uwaterloo's um, sustainability page, um, which is uwaterloo.ca slash sustainability. Um, I encourage you to take what you've heard here and talk with your peers about how you can take action on climate change on campus, um, at home, in your community. Um, and I just want to say one more thank you to, to Catherine for spending her time with us here today. So thank you, everyone. Uh, I hope you all enjoy the, the rest of your day. Thank you so much. Thank you.